everyone. Uh, my name is Majid. It's my great pleasure and honor to be the host for the third SASCOM seminar. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Nikhil Firgasi. Uh, Dr. Nikhil completed his PhD at Virginia Tech uh, Material Science and Engineering in 1999, uh, followed by a postdoc uh, fellowship at Virginia Tech. Uh, he is now a corporate fellow in SAPEX, Corporate Technology and Innovation uh, Organization. Uh, he's responsible for the strategic polymer related activities. Uh, he, he spent three years in Netherlands where he was responsible for setting up SABEX Advanced Composite uh, Center for, of Excellence. Uh, prior to joining SABEX in uh, 2012, uh, Nihil Industrial's career uh, spent 12 years at the Dow Chemical Company, uh, where he held various positions within the uh, research and development department. In, in late uh, uh, 2020, he accepted the additional role of agent professor at Rice Universities in the Department of Material Science and uh, Nanoengineering. Uh, he has written chapters in four books and over 124 uh, peer-reviewed uh, journal papers and conference proceedings. He, he holds 46 filed and granted patents. Dr. Nikhil serves in many international conferences. Uh, please, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nikhil to the SASCOM seminar where he will talk about the thermoplastic composite uh, solutions for mass markets, the opportunities and challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Majid. It's truly an honor. Can you all hear me? Is, is the audio coming across clearly yes. for you? It's very clear. Thank you. Thank you. So, so good day to everyone. I'm not sure where everybody is calling in from, so I will forget all the good mornings and good afternoons. I think you're from different parts uh, calling in. So again, uh, uh, Dr. Majid, uh, Professor Gilles, uh, thank you so much for this great opportunity to be here with you and to share with you my thoughts uh, on, on a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. So I will uh, just share my screen and uh, let me know if you can see it. Uh, and then I will proceed at some point. Is it okay? Yes. Can you see yes. my screen? Yes. Let me just. Uh... Go to slideshow mode and then turn on my laser pointer and uh, do the usual uh, IT related things <laughs> at some point. Uh, like I was saying, uh, this is a great privilege uh, for me to be here and address uh, uh, a really uh, great community of uh, enthusiasts in the area of composite materials. SASCOM is a young organization, but I, I truly do believe in my heart, uh, one that's going to play a pivotal role in the years to come for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and perhaps even for the larger region at la uh, that one is going to influence. Uh, composites, uh, as uh, Majid mentioned in the kind introduction, is very near and dear to my heart, uh, all the way from my graduate school days to my professional life at Dow Chemical and now at Sabic as well. Uh, so I hope to take you down this journey over the next uh, several minutes on uh, thermoplastic composites. Uh, I truly believe the future of uh, continuous fiber reinforced composites will be in the area of thermoplastics for a variety of reasons. And I'm going to drift the conversation increasingly, increasingly in the direction of mass markets. So keep these words in mind, mass markets, because we are really interested in exploding the utilization of composite materials. And when we talk about using them in large, quantities, you have to pay particular attention to some details about how adoption will take place of composites going from the laboratory to pilot level to really mass adoption. And so that presents both opportunities, but nothing is a free ride here. There are challenges that we have to solve and hopefully together we can address these challenges. So with that, let me jump right in. Before I get into the topic at heart of composites, I thought it would be useful to level set uh, who is Sabic. I'm, I'm sure many of you know Sabic for sure. Many others may not know Sabic that intimately well. Sabic today is uh, uh, arguably the second largest chemical company in the world, um, has uh, started in 1976. Keep that number a little carefully in mind because uh, when you look at the overall chemical industry space, uh, the the 45 odd years that Sabic has been in existence, it's still considered a very young company compared to BASF, Dow Chemical, DuPont, and others who have been in existence for over 120 years. Uh, so it's been a phenomenal ride for Sabic all the way to the top of the industry. Uh, it comes uh, 
with a great amount of hard work by many of its employees and solid product lines that it offers to various segments that uh, it participates in. Balance sheet holds about $80 billion worth of assets. Uh, these are chemical plants, et cetera, et cetera. We have over close to 10,000 global patent filings, which is a huge number, uh, which we are very proud of. We are second in the world on brand value behind BASF in terms of total value of the Sabic brand, uh, which is a very proud accomplishment for the company overall, for all of us. And we're truly global, you know, of, uh, uh, you know, participating in over 50 countries now. World headquarters in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. It's often nice to look at our trajectory because it's been a rocket ride, you know, as they say, you know, 45 years, so many actions have happened, so many uh, dynamic movements have happened in the company. You don't become number two overnight without a lot of action taking place. And I would uh, draw your attention, you can look at it at your leisure, but uh, I'll draw your attention to a few highlights along this journey. Obviously, early on, a lot of joint ventures with premier companies who had technology like Shell, ExxonMobil, Mitsubishi. These resulted in concepts called affiliates, Sabic affiliates. And the point I want to mention here is as a company, it's within our DNA to partner with people wherever needed. Uh, we are not shy to do that. And we have proof points of that throughout our history. Um, Global headquarters established in 2002, this, uh, I would say marquee building that you see in the photograph in 2002. Everybody has probably seen it if they've gone through Riyadh. It stands out in the, in the horizon from a long distance away. 2002 also marked one of uh, Sabic's uh, critical uh, acquisitions of the Dutch state mines or DSM uh, in the Netherlands and its polyolefins assets. That was quickly followed up in 2006 with the acquisition of polyolefins assets in the UK of Huntsman. And then shortly after that, probably one of its largest acquisitions, which is all of GE's plastics business, which then uh, did two things for Sabic. One, uh, uh, truly made it a global footprint company uh, with assets all around the world, including North America, but also elevated its product portfolio from the commodity thermoplastics at the bottom of the pyramid into the engineering thermoplastics in the middle of the pyramid and even into the high heat portfolio with our polyether imids and polyphenylene oxide, which are sold under the trade names Altem and Norel respectively, uh, which offer very high TGs and high operating temperature, uh, performance temperatures. The journey continues. Uh, there's a lot more action going on. You can see it at your leisure, like I said. 2017 marked another huge investment by Sabic together with ExxonMobil right here in Texas in Corpus Christi which we call GCGV, which is the Gulf Coast Growth Ventures. Uh, this is a massive brand new installation coming online and uh, product should be coming out of that plant anytime now, basically. Uh, so this is coming online very quickly, which is going to really, really uh, explode our participation in North America in terms of the manufacturing footprint. Uh, 2018 marked uh, acquisition of close to 25% share in Clariant, which is a specialty company out of Switzerland. And then 2020 was a huge year for us with the Saudi Aramco acquiring 70% of Saudi shares. And that has transformed our company under what we call Project New Journey. Very exciting time for us uh, overall. So with that as a backdrop, uh, how is Sabic split up? We have four business units. Uh, we have the petrochemicals unit, which is the giant business unit of Sabic. All of the chemicals, all of the polyolefins, all of the engineering thermoplastics, you can see the product line there that uh, is carried through the business unit. Then we've got the specialties business unit, uh, which are all the high-end thermoplastics, uh, high-end ETPs and high-end heat, high heat polymers, a very growing and robust uh, agri-nutrients business. And for those of you who are carefully uh, uh, following the COPS26 uh, summit in Glasgow and many other meetings, I think this is going to continue to grow. It will be a sense of urgency for the world at large. Uh, what do we do with the uh, agrable land and production of food and so on and so forth. And then we've got a business which is a very captive consumption business in the Middle Eastern region called Hadid or the metals business, uh, which makes all sorts of shapes and forms of metals primarily to satisfy the regional growth in construction and building, uh, building and construction in the region. So quite a diverse portfolio. Just one last slide on Sabic, some really statement or marquee buildings that you can come across with headquarters I touched about in Riyadh, European headquarters in Sittard, Netherlands, very close to the railway station there. You can't miss that one. Beautiful building there. 
North America consolidation took place over the last five, six years into Houston, uh, Texas, with the City West office uh, uh, serving as the America's headquarters. China, Shanghai, Singapore, Riyadh having a state-of-the-art application development center called SPADEC. And then we are uh, missing one building, which is in Bangalore, STC Bangalore, uh, which is uh, another beautiful uh, R&D building that we have. So quite nicely spread out across the globe to satisfy all the demand from the various segments. So with that, let me jump into the topic at large. But before I go deeper into all the challenges and opportunities, let's set the stage for composites a little bit. And as you know, we can get very fancy and very complicated quickly if you want to go deep into composites. But I thought an elegant slide is just a cross plot of cost, cost to produce, sorry, cost to produce the part on the y-axis that you can see here versus performance of the final part on the x-axis. And you see this typical uh, display of various products. You can start with the virgin polymer right here on the far left-hand corner, lowest in performance, easiest to produce through injection molding. Stick with the story of injection molding and we can get a little bit more performance if we reinforce the polymer with short fibers. We can continue that story and get a little bit more performance if we get to long fibers still with injection molding. And then there's a sort of a disruption or a kink in this curve. If you really want to get to ultra high performance, then you have to get to what we call endless fibers or continuous fiber reinforced thermoplastics or thermosets. But unfortunately, that comes at a penalty. Injection molding is no longer the a choice of manufacturing. We have to go to other manufacturing techniques because this is now for the first time not a pellet, it's a sheet and sheets have to be treated as sheets. And when we make parts, we have to shift over to other manufacturing techniques. And that's where the connectivity comes with the mass markets. When we go to really large production volumes, how are we going to deal with that kink in that curve to other manufacturing techniques? Injection molding, no problem. We can satisfy large market demand, right? Uh, automotive, consumer electronics, many, many parts are made, millions of parts are made through injection molding. Not so trivial when you get to continuous fiber composites to address that mass market need. So with that as a backdrop, uh, composites are always a fascinating topic for those who are involved in it. And for those who are coming into this topic through SASCOM, welcome to the journey of composites. It's really a truly a fascinating world. And I, I truly am in love with this topic because it's one of those unique spaces that is multidimensional, right? If you really want to make composites work, you have to pay attention to all the details at various levels of length scale and various disciplines have to come together, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, fluid mechanics, solid mechanics, all of that has to come together to make a true composite work in the application. And I don't need to explain this slide. We can go all the way down to the fiber matrix details, which is sub-micron length scale, talk about the interface between fibers and matrix uh, and how crucial they are to the final composite performance. And as we graduate from right to left on the screen, we can get to the fiber level, filament level, fiber toe level, which is a collection of filaments that you hold in your hand. We can get to tapes, which is the first time when fiber and resin come together to form a sheet. Many, many plies uh, of those tapes form what we call a laminate, laminate into a part. So you can look at the geometric length scale. We're talking about several meters of uh, length scale here, whereas here we're talking about submicron length scale. And all of these have to be addressed if you really want to make composites a true success in, in the marketplace. So in terms of mass markets, before I get into mass markets, you might have a question, what are these mass markets that you're talking about? Mass markets are nothing but markets where repeatedly you have to make a single component hundreds and thousands of times to make it successful, right? And if you look at automotive, a typical build volume of an automotive platform, and I'm not talking about the Ferraris and Lamborghinis and the very high-end racing cars, I'm talking about mid-scale cars, right? It would be at least 60,000 parts. If you get to Volkswagen Golf, it could be 150,000, 200,000 parts because that's a typical bill volume of a, of a run car that we look at. So you got to make that same part 100,000 times equally good, right? Every single time. If you look at the market on the left hand side, I only show you for illustrative purposes the iPhone and the trajectory the iPhone has had. I'm sure each of you have one in your pockets today. <laughs> Almost everybody has an iPhone, and you've seen the massive evolution of the phone miniaturization, content uh, addition into the phone, et cetera, et cetera. Just driving huge performance requirements from a very, very tight packaging space component like this. And, and guess, guess what? When you talk about mass markets, iPhones are made in the millions, right? It's not even 100,000. So you've got to do this job repeatedly well a million times in order to 
qualify at places like Samsung, LG, Apple, and so on and so forth. So huge challenges that we have to escalate uh, when we go from injection molding across. So the concept that we uh, truly believe has a future, I would believe, uh, uh, not only from Saabi, but I think in the world of thermoplastic composites, the reason thermoplastics offer great excitement is because you can get in and out of the tooling very fast. We don't have curing chemistries to deal with like in thermosets. We don't have exothermic reactions to deal with heat transfer problems, getting the heat out of the part where when the chemistry is reacting aggressively. These are all fundamental challenges that slow down the processing cycle times. And, and when you get to mass markets, speed is, is everything. You, know, you need to get in and get out of the tooling as fast as possible. And thermoplastics just inherently offer you that opportunity to get in and, in and out of the tooling fast. Not only that, uh, we don't require any secondary operation like the use of adhesives to join parts together. In thermosets, you gotta, once the material is cured, it's cured. You, if you want to stick two thermoset composites together, you need an adhesive or a, or a glue or a bonding agent, right? To bring these parts together. In thermoplastics, that's not necessary. You can heat up the thermoplastics. There'll be interdiffusion of chain molecules across the interface and you can nicely weld the section together. And, and so that allows again for speed and reduction of secondary operations. And last but not least, the ever increasing importance around recycling, end of life, what will happen to these composite parts at the end, right? A thermoplastics just inherently lend themselves more favorably towards the recycling story. Now, what we believe will be the breakthrough for the utilization of endless fiber reinforced composites is the merger or the hybridization or the coexistence of these product lines. And so in this illustration, what I try to show you is taking full advantage of the pellet-based technology, short fiber, long fiber technology that exists today for years now in automotive and, in and consumer electronics, but marry that together with a very surgical strategic use of continuous fiber composites where the load parts are the highest, where we need that reinforcement is the future. And I would say this is the way we can get to that mass market space. And, uh, and, and typically when you look at how we're going to do this, we're going to bring these two product lines together through either tapes or laminates uh, and, and actually convert that into parts at the end. So hybrid, keep that mind, uh, concept in mind of hybrid composites at the end of the day. So, so the approach, uh, like I said, uh, from Sabic's point of view that we looked at it for some years now is this hybridization concept. It became very clear to us that hybridization will become not only important, but critical for adoption uh, of this technology in, in the long run. And, and another illustration of this is in this sort of a simplistic view. If you want to get very, very high performance composites, you look at thermosets, epoxies, bismalimids, bistriazines, and so on and so forth. Extremely high heat performance thermoset composites, carbon fiber loaded composites. But the cost is going to be very high. Cycle times are going to be very long because you've got to deal with that exothermic cure reaction. Uh, fundamentally to finish up the job. On the far left-hand side uh, where, where you can get in and out of the tooling very fast is classical injection molding, right? You go in and out of thermoplastic injection molding quickly, but the performance is not that great. So in between lies this bringing together the marriage of injection molding thermoplastics together with continuous fiber thermoplastic materials to, to create uh, the best of both worlds, both in terms of performance, part complexity through injection molding, as well as the cost. Uh, uh, maintenance of the final part. We truly believe that the ethos or the fundamental ethos of making this thing happen at the end is paying attention to the concept of the trifecta, the technical trifecta. Uh, and what does that mean? Fundamentally, it's, it's, it's nothing more than paying attention to three pillars of detail. One, clever design. We need to be able to design metallic parts out of metals. And and there's a famous concept that is called black metal design. We don't believe in black metal design because if all you do is take a metallic part, geometry for geometry, switch that into composites, you're never going to succeed at the end of the day. It's going to be much too expensive. So you've got to have mastery over the design principles on composites so you can take maximum advantage of the anisotropy of the composite and put stiffness where you need stiffness or strength where you need strength in the, in the part. And that's what we mean by design uh, out of metals. Materials form the core, and last but not least, pay attention to mass market processing, right? How do we get parts in and out of the entire system quickly? So let's start one by one. When we talk about clever design, it's all about computer-aided uh, design engineering principles, 
having sophisticated enough characterization methodologies when it comes to uh, continuous fiber composites, having that solid material database that we can use for our um, uh, modeling capabilities, uh, things like finite element engineering, having sophisticated enough material models. And this is where we partnered with uh, Professor Giles for a good three years to look at damage mechanics of thermoplastic composites, because that we felt was a largely under addressed area. You know, thermosets was well mastered with aerospace, thermoplastics, not so much. So we had to create those sophisticated models together. And the reason for that is when you get into automotive, they do care about system level performance, right? Uh, and it all starts on the computer first. Uh, that alone is not sufficient. You've got to marry all of that capability with the part processing technologies, right? And I illustrated the use of hybrid injection over molding as a technique to bring both the continuous fiber and the discontinuous fiber pellets together. And so we got to get mastery over the process too. And process and performance go hand in hand. If you just pay attention on the performance side and ignore the process side, you can be in big trouble because you might not make what the computer tells you that you need at the end of the day. So you got to go back and forth. And that's the principle of concurrent engineering. Yeah? Concurrent engineering is a principle where you go back and forth and negotiate and, and get to a, uh, optima at the end of the day. Let me give you a few illustrations of how we have we have uh, illustrated to the world at large. And in this case, I'll walk you through a few automotive examples, right? And these have been well accepted by the automotive industry to be truly game changers, right? Look at a component like a cross car beam. This is that beam that sits in front of you when you sit on the, on the driver's seat, right? It goes from left to right, A pillar to A pillar of the car. On the left-hand side, it carries massive loads of the steering column, et cetera, et cetera. On the right-hand side, it's mostly the glove box, the HVAC units and so on and so forth. So different loading scenarios on the driver side, passenger side, but has massive job to do in terms of torsional rigid, rigidity of the automotive frame. This is an illustration of the Skoda, uh, a Volkswagen family of vehicles, a Skoda vehicle. Uh, total weight of this component for almost five kilograms, but pay attention to this detail. Currently made out of metal, 20 different multi-material systems coming together to make this part. So look at the sub-assembly costs to make this part, quite large, bringing all these materials together. We propose a single shot material, right? Single material, putting continuous fiber composites only where you need them strategically, like I said repeatedly, where the load path is the high, highest, principally on the driver side, where the, where the steering column is being hung off that uh, uh, cross car beam. And on the passenger side where it's lighter loads, just complete the job with just injection molded uh, Star Max and other, other products of, uh, uh, of that sort of similar nature, fundamentally. So everything where you see blue is injection molded uh, pellets of short fiber, long fiber material. And where you see white is continuous fiber laminates or inserts. And the, and the twain come together to form a part which is one piece and lighter in construction, right? Now, don't take my word for it. We did a number of different CAE type of uh, analysis to prove to the automotive industry that this is not just a fancy talk, uh, that we have done some side impact uh, crush resistance uh, type of testing, the pole, side impact pole testing to, uh, to, to evaluate and make sure that we don't have premature failures. We have done some modal analysis to look at uh, other frequencies and so on and so forth, making sure you don't have undue noise creation because you've gone from metal to composite and so on and so forth. But these are the sort of things we do at Sabic routinely to convince the automotive industry before they even graduate to cutting a tool to making a part. Another example I want to give you is the B pillar. All of you know what the B pillar is. It's between the two doors of your car, right? But between the A pillar and the, and the C pillar, that, that spinal column that goes from the rocker panel at the bottom all the way to the roof. It's a fascinating component, highly engineered. It's not a very simple column there. The far, the, the performance load requirements at the base of that pillar near the rocker panel are very different as it graduates to the roof of the, of the vehicle, right? And it has to do a tremendous amount of work, both in terms of side impact, but also crush resistance on the roof down. Uh, and there again, we have shown through this hybridization concept, injection molding a honeycomb structure with various cell architecture changes to accommodate that change in performance requirements from the base to base of the rocker panel to the roof uh, redesigning that through cell architecture designs and hybridizing it with either composite or even the metal, even the metal. So metal composite hybrids are also a very viable process because the automotive industry might be more comfortable in adopting that solution. 
And then we have done the due, due diligence of doing the necessary side impact uh, CAE analysis to make sure that these hybrid structures actually work. They do the job that we tell it it's supposed to do. And the last example I'll give you is that of a uh, tailgate or lift gate, as we call it in a different vernacular. Uh, very complex part. It used to be a very mundane part, uh, a very boring part, but now with more sleeker designs, compact designs, lighter structures, these have become very complex parts as well nowadays. And in order to shift from metal to composite or plastic, uh, it's not that trivial. And you can look at uh, a proposed concept from Subic, where we have light gray indicating all of the usage of the injection molded pellets to do the job. And then where you see the dark gray with the ribbing structure is a continuous fiber composite to locally reinforce those structures. So once again, the coming together of injection molding compounds with continuous fiber composites to get the job done, to replace, again, a multi-material system here of metals, right, to create the lift gate in a single shot or two shot type of a uh, component here. These are the sorts of concepts that excites the industry because it takes out cost, right? It takes out cost in terms of subassembly costs, what we call mass decompounding is a word that we use, take out cost and assembly costs, and also pay attention to the overall lightweighting strategy that we're going to bring uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I'll flip this slide in the interest of time, but we did, uh, just, to, just to mention, we did pay a lot of attention to bringing together various CAE platforms from PAMFORM, which looks at drape forming or shaping of the sheet material against these contours, um, coupling that with mold flow, which is used to uh, judge how our injection molding pellets are going to do once injected into a cavity of a tooling, and then going all the way to the FEA analysis and abacus and so on and so forth, both for the warpage analysis as well as dimensional tolerances as well as mechanical. And making all of these platforms talk to each other left to right was a very complex journey for us. And we spent time working with companies like Impro out of Berlin to create a, probably a very unique integrated simulation chain where one platform could talk seamlessly to the next, to the next, to the next uh, in order to give high fidelity results. Um, let me move on to the actual material forms themselves. I covered one of the trifecta pillars, which is clever design. Hopefully I convinced you that those design concepts were indeed smart. They were able to convince the customer that we can start thinking about moving away from metals, but let me talk about the materials themselves. Materials play a crucial role, an anchor role, right? These tapes need to be of very high quality. And when you want to make tapes, it's basically the coming together or pushing in of that melt flow thermoplastic into continuous fiber materials, right? And that's not a trivial task. You've got fibers that are very densely packed. Sometimes if you look at carbon fiber, 12,000 filaments, 24,000 filaments, 50,000 filaments coming together, very dense fibrous preform, and you're trying to push into that fibrous preform a very viscous fluid like a thermoplastic. And so we oftentimes lean on a flow through porous media from Darcy's law uh, created for soils many, 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 many uh, years ago, uh, actually works quite effectively when we look at flow through porous media uh, and trying to get good impregnation of these tapes to make high quality materials. And I show you a cross-sectional micrograph of such a tape, and this is the one that we work with uh, uh, with Gilles's group here quite, quite heavily, showing the good dispersion of the fibers across left to right, as well as good impregnation with very low void content. Uh, Inside, inside the, inside the uh, fibrous media. And why is that important? I mean, one could argue, hey, let's just make any old tape, right? Let's make some cheap tape. Uh, well, that's, that's a good point. You can make cheap tape, but if you make cheap tape, you're gonna pay the price next step down the road, which is when you try to make good high quality laminates, you're gonna spend a much, much longer time inside the press, inside the autoclave to get rid of those voids. Because remember, you're dealing with thermoplastics. And thermoplastics, by definition, are extremely viscous, material, viscoelastic materials. So to get out air bubbles from deep inside that tape, inside the laminate, and extract that out of the laminate so that you get the highest performance at the end, can sometimes even make it 6x, 7x the cycle time, which is absolutely something we don't want. Because we said the value proposition of thermoplastics is in and out fast, right? Shrink down that cycle time. So my point here is making good quality feedstock materials like tapes is absolutely crucial for you to accomplish that value proposition at the end of the day. And here we worked a lot with the University of Delaware, Delaware and the Composite Materials Lab there. Uh, now, uh, I talked to you about making tapes, I talked to you ma about making laminates, and of course in the lab, we oftentimes lean on things like a, like a press, hot press, right? A 
platen press to make these laminates. And that's okay if you're doing some research type of work in the lab. It's not okay if I wanna go into mass markets because it's much too slow, the process, and much too labor intensive, right? So the way to do that is to uh, jump to continuous processes. And here we invested in our Helene uh, lab capabilities and the center of excellence, what we call a double bell press. A double bell press is one in which if you follow my cursor, we can bring in several rolls of tapes. We can bring in different colors of tapes. You can bring mixed materials here. It really depends what you're trying to do. And you can bring in all of these materials here on the left-hand side and pass it through, collate it, collect all the materials together and pass it through this continuous double belt process here where both heat and pressure are applied as the material is moving, transitory across right to left. And then on the right-hand side, you actually get your laminate at the end of the day in one shot. So by going from a discret discretized process to a continuous process, you can take down that cost to convert. Now that's all good news. So you say, Nikhil, I can make good tapes. I can make good laminates. The cost is in good shape. So where's the, where's the rub? Where's the, where's the, uh, where's the uh, challenge? And the biggest challenge we face today is in layup. And what do you mean by that, Nikhil? Well, if I'm trying to make just unidirectional composites, that's very easy. I just need to go through a double well press, just load up all my pre-pregs on my tapes on one side, all unidirectional, and out comes a nice unidirectional laminate, zero degree laminate. But we rarely ever use a unidirectional laminate in any component that I showed you. We want to play with that anisotropy, right, layup. And the layup turns out is a rate limiting step today. How am I going to place layers like 0, 90, 45, minus 45, quasi-isotropic, et cetera, et cetera, in a mass market mentality, right? I'm not talking about ones and twos. And there, there's a lot of work going on uh, from people like, uh, you know, uh, Diefenbacher, uh, you see the word fiber forge. Now it's actually uh, Diefenbacher owns this technology. Here you use robotics uh, of uh, placement of tapes with a rotating table. So every time the table rotates, you can put in a different angle ply and these ultrasonic horns come down and through ultrasonic welding, you essentially can layer, layer by layer additive manufacturing, build up your plies and then ultrasonically weld the entire structure. And then you can move such a structure through a double bell press. And then the cost economics work out. But this is still gray for me because there's more work to be done in order to address efficient layup in order to address those millions of parts in consumer electronics or hundreds of thousands of parts in automotive. We did a lot of fundamental work. We were not satisfied that, oh, we have a double bell press, so let's go off and start running it. We invested in fundamental science here, process uh, lamination physics. We worked closely with uh, Professor Jack Gillespie and uh, Suresh Advani at Delaware to exploit what they had already built at Delaware and really took it to the next level and uh, utilize this uh, consolidation physics tool at Sabic to look at different polymers. So if I move from polypropylene to polyethylene to tomorrow polycarbonate, for example, what should be those temperatures, times, et cetera, to get good efficient welding of the ply by ply, you know, so I get good interlaminar uh, strength. And that this uh, uh, lamination process tool was really, really helpful for us. So I talked to you about tapes and laminates and process technology. Let me finish up my story with that last pillar of the trifecta, which is bringing it all together and actually saying what I said I can do, let me show you I can do it. So I talked to you very much about hybrid composites, right? The world is in hybrid composites, marriage of two material systems. And the process that I'm going to choose and to choose to spend the next three slides on with you all is what I call hybrid injection over molding. So it's still injection molding, why? Because these are assets that companies like automotive companies and consumer electronic companies have already invested in. Those are invested capital in the ground. So let me take advantage of that. But on top of that, I'm going to surround it with robotics to do injection over molding. So I entered with my team into a tri-party adventure with uh, George Kaufman out of Switzerland, a very, very talented tool builder. And I'll show you the tool that they build, built. Uh, I worked very closely with the, our team worked very closely, Sabic team worked very closely with Krauss Maffei out of Munich, Germany. And we still use the University of Delaware to do a lot of the uh, testing and the validation exercises. And what were we trying to do? We were trying to make this part here. This beam here is about one meter long. It's got some complexities built into it. And there are some very good design reasons for this. So people like Warden Skype and others had done the design of this. But it also was the ultimate challenge to this concept because it's got a double curvature to this. It's got the omega-shaped curvature going from left to right, 
up and down, but it's also got a curvature along the length. That's got a, it's got a little bit of a dip in the in the center, and and all that was done not not because there's a real part that looks like this, but it was to push the envelope and push the limit of this hybrid injection over molding and tell us where are we going to drop off, where are we going to have those failure points that we're going to have to address. Uh, and so we first always started off with thorough CAE engineering to make sure when we are going to fail, we're going to fail in the right locations and that this part is sufficiently designed. And then this is an actual part that we made. And we filed uh, several patents on this technology as well. A word or two about hybrid injection over molding. Schematically, this is what it's all about. At the core of it, you have an injection molding tool, right? But all around it, you have robotics, pick and place robotics and uh, heating and preheating mechanisms. So it always starts with the robot picking up the laminate, right? Taking it into an infrared heating chamber so you can get uh, the surfaces nice and hot. Why? Because we need to weld it, right? We need to get that intimate uh, connection, right? Uh, with that injection over molding compound that's going to make contact with that uh, insert. We don't want the insert to be cold coming into the tooling because then the delta T or the absolute temperature that interface is going to be creating problems for us where we won't get that adhesion that we need between the insert with the injection over molding material. So preheating is required. The robot then picks it out of the infrared uh, chamber and then brings it into the tooling. The tooling closes and then it's just conventional injection molding after that. So all of this is done by Krausmapai. Uh, it's called the fiber form cell. By now, even Engel has its own machines and many other companies have machines like this. So this is not a novelty anymore. People do this. And it's a very compact uh, footprint uh, type of an architecture of a technology here. So that's about schematics. Let me show you now the video and hopefully the video comes, uh, comes out. Um, uh, um, so I'm gonna play the video one time. You're gonna see the actual video of this particular beam being made. And just let me explain to you what you're gonna be seeing. <clears throat> Everywhere you, where you see the red, are those continuous fiber laminates, not tapes, laminates, right? Continuous fiber unidirectional laminates being placed both on the both on the flange as well as on the on the on the on the other locations here. And everywhere where you see green is the injection molding compound, what we call Starmax, Sabic product Starmax. Huh? So this is what we're going to try to make. And the video will start with those red materials, right? Which is actually black in color, but it's red for, for the sake of illustration. Here comes a robot picking up those three materials. One, two, three. It's going to lift this, take it up, and go into the heating heating chamber. Again, just to get that surface nice and hot so that we can get that welding going on. It's going to take it out of the heating chamber. And I'm going to press pause now. Now, I'm going to pause the button here just for a second. This is all conventional injection molding from here on out. This particular tool was all built by George Kaufman in Switzerland. You can see a few features here. You can see that dip in that curvature. I talked to you about the double curvature part here. So you can see the dip already embossed into the tooling. You can see there's going to be an exchange from the robot tool grippers into the grippers of the tool itself uh, in this section here. Yeah, so let me pause the button. You saw that shifting, right? That exchange from the gripper of the robot into the gripper of the tooling. And you see these piston grippers here. Each of these piston grippers are individually controlled. And the reason for this is you want a careful contour, right, that we're trying to make. And some of the contour is built in due to plunger displacement, right, and getting you that nice curvature here. So now the inserts, the continuous fiber inserts are now locked and loaded inside the tooling. The tooling is going to basically shut down. And the Starmax is going to be injected in. Right? So, so you saw the entire cycle and all of the cycle is done in 45 seconds. We slowed down the video just to make, make, uh, make you uh, see the entire steps, but the, but, the, but the entire process from start to finish is 45 seconds. So I'm principally in a position now to make a part one meter long with all of this curvature and complexity in less than a minute fundamentally. And that's the beauty of thermoplastics that we wanted to demonstrate to the world that we can do. I'll play it one more time and I'll stop. Yeah. 
So, so in principle now, hopefully through the video, you can see coming into life, that schematic that I presented to you, the concept that I presented to you, and it all starts with good design, great materials, and a fantastic process that can do the job at the end. So that theme, that recurring theme, hopefully just resides with you throughout this talk. Now, it's one thing to make a beam. You'll say, Nikhil, how good was this beam at the end, right? So we went to the University of Delaware where we did uh, testing both in compression and tension on this one meter long beam, uh, both in terms of room temperature results as well as at elevated temperature results. And we did this both at quasi-static uh, testing conditions as well as drop impact conditions. And I'm going to just show you one flavor of the results and compare the simulation of the CAE versus the actual experiment. So let me just focus on the left-hand side for you. Let me get my pointer back up. Here's the data at room temperature, force versus displacement. When I did the test in tension, you can see the actual experimental data in blue, multiplicity or application showing some nice tight data here, both in terms of stiffness as well as in terms of strength. It's pretty, pretty good for this complex part. And you can see in red, the actual CAE simulations doing a pretty good job, both in terms of linear elastic stiffness, but also being able to predict the onset of failure, huh? uh, the point of failure pretty well within, within satisfaction for this complex hybrid part. We flipped the beam around and did the test in four point compression. And we did the same thing. Here's all the experimental data nicely bunched up in compression, compressive failure. And once again, not only stiffness, but also the onset of strength or failure, we can predict quite well through CAE. So quite satisfied at room temperature. Change the problem around to elevated temperature, the problem gets more complex, of course. You can see both in tension and compression, the data is pretty tight. We can still do a pretty good job of the linear elastic physics as well as the onset of failure, but we do a horrible job of predicting everything after that, right? That area under the curve to the right of this, we're simply not able to capture that energy content uh, coming in at elevated temperature. And the reason for that is it comes down to that understanding, deep understanding of the damage mechanics, initiation, propagation, the crosstalk between the different damage and the heavy amount of viscoelasticity that the resin will bring because it's a thermoplastic. And this was the onset of our work with GEALS for the last, uh, when we did that three to four year program. We realized we had a gap and this gap had to be addressed because there's a lot of energy that we're not capturing through CAE here. And so in a sense, we wanted to close that gap and, and that's what we worked on. So it's still a challenge uh, I'll leave Gilles to comment if he agrees or disagrees. It's still a challenge, I think, to get all of this addressed, but we're making tremendous progress here to build that confidence in the industry that these things do work at the end. So with that, I'll stop uh, at, at, uh, and, 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 and leave the floor for questions. I think we've got maybe 15 minutes uh, or so. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Nakhir, for the nice and excellent presentation. Um, um, we have around uh, 15 minutes for uh, questions so, and uh, discussion. So, uh, Jill, if you have a question or... Uh... Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Nikhil, for the excellent presentation. It's very impressive, the work, but I mean... Uh, Sabik is able to demonstrate now on these hybrid structures now. There is one question for Marie from the, on the chat, uh, Majid. Maybe you should start with this one, I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, before that, uh, for the audience, uh, thank you very much for your uh, attendance. Uh, please, if you have any question, please write it in the, in the Q&A uh, uh, section. Uh, so the first question uh, from Dr. Arif, uh, uh, is about uh, what are the technology optimization techniques that Sabic was working on uh, to achieve the efficient uh, uh, tailgate of a car? Uh, how was it translated into uh, hybrid composites? Uh, it's in page 20. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me... Page 20. Uh, may, may I... Just ask a slight clarification question on the first part of the part. When you say optimization techniques, are you looking at topological, op I mean, uh, computational optimization or material optimization here? Is it possible to get a little bit clarity there? Um, uh, else, if it's not possible, I can I can continue yeah, on. So, yeah, Arif, if, uh, so I, 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 I think it's the... Uh, uh, Okay, it's a geometry optimization. Yeah. 
you may take okay. a look. Yeah, so I think I think uh, it's best put. I think optimization on both those vectors need to take place, geometric uh, as well as topological. Right? I mean, we need we need. No, no, sorry, I said the same thing. Topological as well as material placement. That's what I mean. Uh, uh, you you want to be very very prudent on where you want to use the continuous fiber composite. The reason is very simple. Automotive is extremely cost sensitive market. You can make a fantastically designed part and just throw composite everywhere, but it's a no go from a business case point of view. So one optimization that we have to keep thinking about is, can we get away with as less of the continuous of a composite that we can possibly get away with, compensate that with the injection molding material, right? And where we can't get the stiffness from the continuity of the fibers or continuous fibers, because we're gonna minimize the use of that, we're gonna compensate that with geometric stiffening like ribbing and so on and so forth, right? You can see the ribs, the various amount of ribs in the part in this component. So we're gonna to try to get the stiffness out of the ribs because it's, it's a lower cost solution at the end of the day. I could do the same thing with a lot of composite material, trust me, I can get it. And I can reduce the complexity of this geometry, get rid of the ribs and so forth, but then the cost is gonna to get too high. So we always keep the techno-economics in mind, right? We do a calculation back of the envelope to say, what's happening to the cost trajectory? And if the cost is going up, which we call dollars per kilogram weight saved, that's the number we keep in mind. For every kilogram you save or weight, the industry is willing to pay you some premium, but not too much, huh? not too much. There's a, there's, a, there's a level. And so we always look at that point uh, when we're trying to place these composites. We'll try to play the magic of ribbing and geometric stiffening as much as we can get away with it. And then where we cannot and we reach a roadblock, we're going to put the continuous fiber composites there. I don't know if I've answered the question completely, but that's a sort of thought process that we have when uh, folks like Warden, uh, Recep, uh, many other, uh, Sandeep, many other competition people at Sabic think about the problem. They're constantly thinking about the problem, right? Because, uh, because, uh, because we have to pass all of the other requirements too. It's not just stiffness and strength. We got to hit that crash pole in side impact, roof crush, so on and so forth. There are at least 16 different scenarios that we have to computationally show virtually, albeit, to the automotive industry that we have a solution with. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so there, there, there is another question from uh, Hassan Mahmoud. Uh, uh, he thanks you for the nice presentation. And then his question is, uh, uh, why is it difficult to predict the damage in finite element models? Yeah, so that's that's a little bit of a loaded question, and I don't think I'll do justice enough. But I think Gilles is on the call, Arif is on the call. We all work together heavily on this. Uh, part of the reason for this is uh, composites are just heterogeneous materials by definition, right? And and when we talk about damage, we're not talking about uh, monitoring a single crack and carefully tracking where that crack is going, like in a virgin polymer or a uh, plastic material, right? We, we can follow cracks. But in composites, which are typically 60% by volume fraction loaded with continuous fibers, all different orientations, intraply mechanics, interply mechanics, uh, very quickly it becomes a, a, a cumbersome problem to deal with fundamentally. You know, what are we tracking? Are we talking about transverse matrix cracking? Are we talking about transverse matrix cracking propagating to the interlaminar region? Are we talking about uh, interply failure, are we talking about delamination physics? What do we need to start addressing here? So first and foremost, in my mind, humble opinion, it's important to understand what are those damage failures that we can observe in the part. So when we test the part and take it to failure, what all are we seeing in terms of failure, failure modes that are taking place? Then and only then we can start addressing the key points here. Beyond that, Beyond that, we have a highly viscoelastic viscoplastic matrix that we're dealing with, right? It's not an epoxy thermoset. Epoxy thermosets are highly cross-linked, glassy, rigid materials. They're brittle, albeit, but in terms of polymer physics, they're fairly linear elastic to failure. That, that's it. They have very low fracture toughnesses and they have hardly any indication of yielding and plasticity, and that's it. The very beauty of thermoplastics is its ductility and toughness. But the challenge computationally is you got to deal with all of that mechanics at the end of the day in an environment where failures are taking place, cracks and delaminations are taking place. And so maybe it's a long answer I'm giving, but all of that has to be handled very carefully when you're trying to look at that, that huge area of the curve that takes place beyond first failure, right? first ply failure or first location failure. Gilles, I don't know if I've 
uh, inadequately address the question, but uh, please. Uh, please. No, I, I fully I fully agree with you, and I think I think one of the complexity also in this is that as as Nikhil said at the beginning of the seminar, when when you start to handle composite problems like this, it's 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 a stacking of layers of difficulties from different fields, from I mean from computational mechanics to the constitutive model to things like this, and and being able to describe I mean from every single step accurately is, is quite complicated in this structure. So I think it's, uh, no, I, I, uh, I totally agree with your question, uh, Nikhil. I had, I had another question sure, sure. Uh, that was more about how, how does this autom automatization, is at the end of the day, is changing the value chain when it comes to CEVIC? I mean, uh, no, now, now you are introducing not uh, semi product, for example, when you are creating, uh, let's say, uh, when you, I mean, a massive production for laminates and things like this, this from the Sabic point of view is creating some, I mean, some new products in between the raw polymers and the final product. Uh, and there is, uh, and this probably changed from your point of view a little bit the way you see the, I mean, where, where, where do you, are you willing to stop at Sabic? Where, where do you locate exactly your value chain? And I mean, where do you consider that this is a boundary of what, what you are willing to do? And, and what is, you know, I stop here at this, uh, this level of semi product and this now, this is the job of the end users and everything, so. Great question, Gilles, thank you for asking that. Let me go back a few slides to the trifecta and I'll probably address it through the trifecta. I think there's no question in our mind at Sabic that we will continue to be a workhorse, attention to detail type of people around the material space. Nothing will change that for us. We will look at the polymer very carefully. We will look at the, uh, the act of making the tape or the pre-preg very carefully because it's easy for us to say somebody down the value chain, you go make the tape. But we control the chemistry. We know the polymer physics better than anybody else. So we have to partner here with those people who are making the tapes and so forth. So we will focus on that region. We will continue to pay a great amount of attention on the design because we believe at the end of the day, that's our credibility. That's our story to tell to the industry segment at large. The place where we will pause a little bit is the act of actually making the part. Uh, this, if I, if I focus, just to answer your question on the automotive uh, segment, it's a very mature segment, GLs, where we have the OEM, we have tier ones, we have tier twos, we have an entire ecosystem around the automotive OEM. Sometimes the OEM wants to keep it close to the chest, sometimes the OEM wants to give it to the tier ones to do it. Either way, we understand that rhythm very well. And we will rely on the tier ones to actually make the part at the end. And increasingly, the tier ones are investing in hybrid injection over molding capacity. If mm -hmm. you look at the Mercedes Benz, uh, uh, I think it's a sprinter, the front end carrier, front end carrier where the, where the hood latches on, right? And where the radiators hung off. We have for the first time a mass produced hybrid over molded composite structure now with Valio as the tier one and Mercedes as the OEM. And the material supply is doing their business to make sure value is successful at the end. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, the door, we have another example where Broser is the tier one out of Germany. And we are providing, we, we and I'm using it generically, not just Savik, but others too, supplying materials and knowledge, et cetera. So I think where we stop, uh, where we draw the line in the sand is actually making of the part, the liability around making the part and ensuring successful time in and time out consistency of the part, we leave it to the ecosystem like the tier one, tier two. That being said, I must preface that answer by saying, it is still, we consider it our responsibility to demonstrate like the beam. Why did, why did Sabik make the beam? Maybe is what's going through your mind. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason for that is back to that interdisciplinary work. I truly believe it's a sensitive area, right? Thermoplastic composites are still at its infancy. And when something is at the infancy, incubating becomes a challenge. And we don't want to have slips, trips, and falls here, which is to say, I don't care, you go make it, right? Because that's traditional thinking. Well, if that happens and we have a failure, that's a big black mark on the future of thermoplastic composites. So we try to do as much as possible on the trifecta ourselves, but doing it doesn't mean that we are going to actually produce those parts. We will, we will produce it through the tier one ecosystem, tier two ecosystem. But but we, we felt it was important to bring the trifecta together and, and in live action and make some part to demonstrate, even if it's a simple beam, right? It's not mm -hmm. so simple, actually. It's a beam, quite a large beam, but we wanted to show the OEM and the tier ones, it can be done, guys. We can do it. But now it's your problem. You've got to make it at the end. So that mm -hmm. would be my divide line at the end. Mm -hmm. 
I, I mean, I, I think Sabic is a, it's one of the specificity of Sabic. I mean, you did a, a very impressive job in, in making proof of concept of what, what, can be do, what can be done with hybridization concepts and things like this. So this is really, uh, and this is the beginning of the path because now, uh, I mean, you have this hybrids between Starmax and, and, and continuous fibers, but then, then this is going to go with uh, multifunctional materials, integration of functions, multiple things that are coming with advanced polymers and everything. So this is really the beginning of something that I think Sabic has, I mean, we, has, has a lot to do in this, but that's great. We have, uh, I, I think like you said, Gilles, it's, it, it's a very true statement. If I move away from all of these markets and look at uh, pipes, for example, the work we are doing together with Aramco, for example, on RTP, is the same. It's mixed materials coming together. We have a liner, we have a structural material around the liner, and we yeah. still have to master the art of hybridizing and making the entire structure work at the end. So everything that we've been invested in so far is going to hold us in good stead in the in the, in the times to come. Yeah. Well, Majid, we still have a couple of yeah. questions on the Q&A on the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. I saw that. Yeah. yeah, we have a question from uh, Abraham about the uh, plastic component of the uh, hybrid uh, approach. Uh, is, is it a plastic or it's re reinforced with uh, short fibers, for example? Great question. I'll, I'll answer it in a generic fashion. The examples I gave you in automotive, they are reinforced plastics because uh, we simply can't get the job done with just pure plastic. Uh, yeah, we need the stiffness. We need that uh, performance. So it's the coming together of Starmax with our continuous fiber product. Uh, if I look at a pipe configuration, for example, or a consumer electronics uh, housing uh, application, sometimes it's a coming together of virgin plastic unreinforced, uh, let's say, let's put it that way, with the continuous fiber composite. So uh, I use the word hybrid in a rather loose sense of the word, but in uh, it just depends segment by segment, what do they need? Uh, so you have a last question, uh, let's go with you, so for the, about uh, is there any uh, future plan to manufacture natural fiber in uh, uh, Sabic? I always get this question, I think. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. Uh, look, I think um, I will never say never is never. I think uh, natural fiber composites uh, are still an active area of uh, investigation, I would say. People are looking at it. We do have some examples of it in series production and vehicles, for example. Uh, I think uh, last time I checked, one of the great uh, stories that natural fibers was bringing to the table was the sound dampening capabilities or the noise deadening capabilities that we're bringing. But natural fibers have their own unique challenges. Of course, uh, uh, Mother Nature does not give us consistency of supply. <laughs> that is the number one challenge we face. So we have to deal with lot to lot to lot uh, supply uh, consistency challenges. Number two, many of the natural fibers are highly hydrated systems, right? Uh, that's how nature makes these fibers. So we've got to play careful attention to the water levels or the moisture levels, bound and unbound water levels in these systems. Why? Because they will start playing a role at the interface, right? We need to get that connectivity between fiber and matrix and we have to pay attention to how are we gonna, how are we gonna get that good bonding? So I'll, I'll say never is never, but I think our attention is largely focused on things like glass fibers, carbon fibers, uh, basalt maybe for example, uh, on occasion, you know, this is where we are spending time. Excellent, fantastic. Um... Mohammed, uh, do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Nakhil, for the nice presentation. It was quite enlightening. Uh, I have a very simple question. How do you see the uh, end of life cycle of such uh, hybridization between the composite and thermoplastic material? Thank you. Thank you for that question. It is probably very hot on everybody's mind. I said thermoplastics are recyclable and they have a story. Um, um, so, so where we are today, Certainly, with some of these uh, value propositions I showed you on the B pillar, on the tailgate, on the uh, cross car B, we always run an LCA analysis, a life cycle analysis, to show them what will happen when we compare that to your current multi metal material systems that you're dealing with, right? Uh, and I don't want to lose track of the word multi materials because when it comes to end of life, mul multiplicity of the materials becomes a major challenge at the end of the day. You got to sort, you have to break it down, you have to get all these materials apart, et cetera, et cetera, and deal with it separately. So from an LCA basis point of view, we are fairly confident that we have a compelling story compared to metals today. Now, 
That being said, what are we going to do with the thermoplastic material? Are we going to go mechanically grind it down? Are we going to do chemical breakdown, et cetera, et cetera? I must admit, we have not done enough work on that topic. We have to do more. We have to do more to understand continuous fiber composites, short fiber composites, continuous fiber. Okay, one strategy could be just crush it down, break it down, chip it, make it into chips and downgrade the use of that material next time as a filler for concrete or something else, right? That could be one strategy that one uses. Even better strategy could be, can I, can I recover those fibers, you know, and use that continuous fiber again in some way. Uh, but, uh, but those are just things I'm speaking to you about. Uh, the world at large has not come up with elegant solutions to this today, but, but we will have to do so in, in times to come. Yeah. But one thing for sure I can tell you, it's going to be, it's going to be a more elegant solution compared to thermosets because with thermosets, you have only one choice, which is to pyrolyze the resin on the mess. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Michel, for the uh, excellent presentation, uh, which covers uh, a really uh, interdisciplinary uh, research and development. Uh, and we thank you very much uh, for your time and for the uh, for the excellent uh, discussion as well. Uh, so that thank, thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate your uh, uh, your 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 excellent presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Majid. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, everybody, for whoever was involved in pulling this together. It's a lot of work. I, I know for sure. For me, it was an, again. Let me reiterate a pleasure. I could not see all the faces clearly, so I don't know who are on the call. But if there are any questions, please don't hesitate. Uh, please let them keep coming in. It's 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 one that I have a lot of passion for. So let's engage in a dialogue, right? Because at the end, we want nothing more than to see success of thermoplastic composites. So, so with that, I'll say thank you very much and stay safe, everyone. Yeah. Well said. Thank well you said. very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.